Okay, it's a little awkward because I have to welcome everyone um, <laughs> online as well and give a little explanation. So the last few days, I think seven days with the Green Program, uh, all these students, amazing students here, have come to learn about sustainable energy uh, in Iceland. And we've done amazing things like hiking on glaciers, going to bathe in a hot river, but also working on capstone projects that solve real world problems. Uh, there are no ideas that are too big for the green, the green program capstone project, so I'm excited to see what you guys have uh, coming up. So we'll just get started. The first project is uh, plastic elimination and plastic globe globbing enzyme. Love it. Gobbling. <laughs> gobbling, oh my gosh. <laughs> gobble, gobble. gobble, gobble. The garbage girls. Yes. Yeah. Hi guys, we are Melina. I'm Sarah. I'm Georgia. I'm Christine. And we are talking about plastic elimination, which we like to call the plastic gobbling enzyme. Mm -hmm. um, our product term, yes. I forgot to describe, sorry, that you'll have 15 minutes. Oh. Uh, I'll set a timer and it'll be like, I'll give you a warning at five minutes, at three minutes, and at one minute. Uh, and then we'll have five minutes for questions, also from the audience. Sorry, nice. you may restart. <laughs> <laughs> plastic gobbling enzyme. We like to call this product Paste E, standing for plastic waste elim er, enzyme. Pasty. 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 Saving the world one enzyme at a time. Do we, we do yeah. one of these? Okay. All right, so we just wanted to start off with asking you guys what you think happens to plastic medical waste once it's done in the hospital. So feel free to shout it out. Just throw it away in the landfill. Yes. Oh, in landfill. Oh, oh my gosh, you guys. Oh, wow. good mention. Yes. <laughs> and we will specifically answer that question as we go through the, the presentation. So first we're going to talk about the problem, and that is our medical plastic waste accumula accumulation. So. Our what is we're unable to recycle plastic medical waste due to contamination. So things like disease, blood, so many things that um, just cause our plastic waste in the hospitals un to be unrecyclable. So the only that way that we can dispose of it right now is incineration, which is a burning type of process that we'll go into in a little bit. How? We're going to create an e efficient method for plas medical plastic disposal through the use of a degrading enzyme. And then why do we want to do this? Well, hospitals across the country um, create a lot of waste. So this leads to a large energetic cost um, to run the incinerator. That is you know, the method that's out there right now. Um, and these removal methods are unsustainable. So we want to fix that. So. Um, plastic waste accumulation. Um, in the United States alone, there is a creation of 2.79 kilograms per bed per day of waste created. And in the United States, there's about 916,000 hospital beds. So if we assume that a quarter of those are filled each day, that means that every day in the U.S. we're generating 639,000 kilograms of medical waste. And furthermore, the healthcare waste management cost is about 5.1 million per year, which is a lot. <laughs> so we're going to go into what specifically um, we're working with within the hospital. So the largest, um, I guess, items that we are wasting in the hospital is personal prote protective equipment or PPE. So this is your gowns, your masks, gloves. They're used all the time. If you work in healthcare, you know that these are wasted very frequently. 
Um, so during COVID alone, hospitals spent over $3 billion on PPE. And then um, of the 87% of additional plastic waste generated, PPE accounted for 7.6%. So we're talking about a lot um, that was just PPE specifically. Um, and a key thing to note here is all of this was just incinerated um, via the healthcare waste management system. So how exactly is medical waste disposed? What is the process? So first, the waste is generated in hospitals, like Sarah mentioned. And then this contaminated waste is disposed in a bin organized by colors. And then the medical waste disposal service collects these bins. After that, here, I might have to move this a little closer. I can't read that far. OK. <laughs> Forgot my glasses. Mm -hmm. So then after that, the waste is then sorted and incinerated at the disposal center, and that incinerated a uh, product is then taken to the landfill. So why do we want to um, dispose of medical plastic waste in another way that's not incineration? Well, medical waste companies um, currently um, dispose of medical plastic waste via incineration, which is their only current method. Um, and incineration, as you probably already know or would have guessed, um, produces atmospheric pollutants, including particulate matter, which you might also know is microplastics carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and many other um, greenhouse gases. Furthermore, the global medical waste management market is expected to grow from 7.2 billion to 12.8 billion by 2030, which is crazy that's only in six years. Mm -hmm. So while an increase in market is kind of um, a response to an increase in more um, incineration product, that also means we have an opportunity for growth and sustainability. Okay, so the specific type of incinerator that's used for medical waste is called the controlled air incinerator. And this is, um, well, first of all, a study was done in 2020. Um, it analyzed the performance of a large-scale incinerator installed in a hospital. And the results of this, you can see the red part is showing that <clears throat> there was a ton of liters um, that was incinerator per day. And then the important thing to notice too is that about 50 liters of fuel per cycle so all this diesel this oil that was being used and causing um, emissions into the atmosphere so you can see from these graphs that which is a pretty obvious thing but to note that with more creation of waste there was more need to incinerate and so on average they had about 360 liters of diesel needed per day and that breaks down to about 46 liters of diesel required per hour. So what is the cost of incineration? Well, the main disadvantage of medical waste incineration is the emission of pollutants to the atmosphere, um, which are extremely toxic, as I mentioned before. But an estimated 3.4 million tons of medical waste are generated in the U.S. every year. And the incineration of one ton of plastic is equivalent to 2.7 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, which basically for all your plastic waste, you're getting double that in carbon dioxide emissions, which is not good. So over 1.7 million tons per year of plastic waste is generated by just the healthcare industry in the U.S. And burning plastic adds about 16 million metric tons of greenhouse gases into the air. And for every metric ton of plastic waste recycled, more than one ton of carbon dioxide emissions is avoided. So by eliminating plastic, we would save about 1.7 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year, which is very good. So how do we plan to do this? We laid out the problem. We laid out exactly what it is we're trying to target. But how would we do it? So plastics that we're specifically targeting are made up of something called polyethylene terephthalate. And this is just the plastic that we're targeting, and the plastic that's targeted is something called an enzyme, which is called PETase. And the enzyme specifically recognizes its target, which is PET. You can see in figures A and B, you see the binding event happening. And once it binds the protein to this PET molecule, there's degradation of the plastic. And so the way that we would go about tar or, um, harnessing this is to genetically and biochemically engineer this enzyme to degrade all forms of plastic. And so the way we would do this is do a broader metagenomic analysis, which is to take all these different types of plastic and apply our engineered enzyme to all the different types to see what works. Once we do that, we can convert this novel enzyme into an enzyme-containing spray. 
which you can see right there. All right, so going into more of the business side of this. So for our key resources, we're obviously going to need the physical lab. So along with that, we're going to need the biochemical engineers, the lab staff, equipment, packaging scientists and engineers. And then also with the marketing, we're going to have a social media presence. Uh, we want to go out to conferences, make sure we're networking. And then the commercial production, we're going to need equipment and employees. And then additionally, we're going to want to patent our products, so legally we'll need patent lawyers. And then with our key activities, we're going to need to develop a product, and we're going to do that in the wet, li wet lab um, with enzyme and for the enzymes and engineer and synthesize the product. Um, we're going to want the mass production, as we talked about before, and then surveys to identify um, the demographic that we want to target. So what are the hospitals willing to pay? What are the waste companies willing to pay? And then market and advertising, so educating um, through the hospitals and conferences, and then additionally spreading that information to hospital admins, um, networking, and definitely the waste management companies. So going into the cost analysis, uh, about 60% of our funds will be going into lab and research development. Um, 15 or around 12% will be going into uh, commercial factory, so that's going to be the actual physical factory for production and also all of our workers involved there. And then only 0.2% is going to go into marketing, so it's just like advertising, getting the word out, um, going to all these networking events. And then around 25% is going to go into the production of our product. And we will be obviously making our revenue through um, selling to waste companies and also directly to hospitals. And then what we will do with any additional revenue, um, we want to reinvest in the expansion and research of our product, of our product, and then also uh, donate to our university that we plan on partnering with, and then also donating to waste relief efforts such as waste aid. And then partners and key stakeholders. So with uh, networking, we hope to make some connections with hospital directors and then medical and scientific companies as well, and the clinicians too, so doctors, nurses, and other health healthcare staff, and then the waste companies that we're selling to as well, and then the universities that we plan to have a, a partnership with of they can send their students over to help with research, and the students gain some research so who will pay? Who will help invest in this? So there are a few companies such as Thermo Fisher Science and Hampton Research that have branches of their government that are interested in things like renewable energy sustainability. And so we plan on reaching out to these companies to see if they're willing to invest and have some of maybe their resources um, allotted to us and our project. So how are we going to reach our clients? So um, again, ten attending these um, hospital waste management conferences to sell and advertise our product. And some of these conferences include the Waste 360 Healthcare Waste Conference and the International Waste Management Conference in uh, 2024. And then we want to go on site to the hospitals and even the waste management companies and um, do some visitations with them and also surveying our clientele. And then advertisement as well um, through our, with our med. Uh, tech salesman. Mm -hmm. So how, in, all in all, we described the problem, we described how we're going to actually get around to doing something that, like this, but what's the impact? How will this save energy and reduce emissions? So um, by minimizing the amount of incineration product, we will therefore be saving the energy that is required to use an incinerator and thus reducing CO2 emissions. And of course, another thing that we would be doing is lowering the actual cost for medical waste companies um, and hospitals to degrade their plastics, so we're saving a ton of money there. Um, and thus, also, as another big, huge thing, um, is a more sustainable solution. Mm -hmm. Thank so you, thank guys. Thank you. Thank you. That. If anyone wants to see that. <laughs> Jake, uh, his question is, what is 
left after the enzyme is used? Melina? They call it sludge, um, which is just like, they don't really have a scientific word for it. They literally just call it sludge. I think it's just organic material, um, which is with any other organic material, you, I think you could just put it on the ground. Maybe use it as fertilizer, I don't know. They call it sludge. There's not enough research, I think, on it. But we could do that research. I have yeah. a question. So um, you said one of the problems, like one of the reasons why incineration is like the only solution to um, get rid of like the medical waste is because of like the diseases and stuff. Mm -hmm. So would turning it into sludge also, like, would that have any side effects in terms of like spreading more diseases? Or like, how would you deal with like that aspect? There's other treatments um, besides just incineration is basically because you have this mass product, like hard things that you have to burn to turn into ash. And there's other heat treatments known as like autoclaving where it's like a really high temperature like steam that also, um, and like UV light too. Mm -hmm. um, but basically um, we are trying to minimize like the actual amount of incineration product. So if you turn it into the sludge that can be then subjected to like Made, like you're burning it, but you're not like burning off all these emissions. Like mm -hmm. it's just kind of like this yeah. watery sludge thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're reducing a lot of um, like oil that's used for incineration. Like basically have none of that. And really yeah. the great part about it is there is no side effects. There's no outstanding factors that are released or things like that. So mm -hmm. that's a plus. Um, which sustainable development goals are your projects connected to project connected to? All of them. <laughs> no, um, definitely like the land and atmosphere one. Mm -hmm. like reducing yeah, emissions, reducing uh, plastic, saving energy. Yeah. Yeah. F fuels and things like that. We're decreasing all of that. Yeah. And where in the sustainability complex are you helping the most? Let's see. Energy consumption? Like, is it uh, individual, household? Oh, I see. Community, national? I would say community, community and also and national. national. And I think looking like very far in the future, this could be applied to like all plastics in cool. general. Like, right now, we're just focusing on the um, PPE. But if we're able to take this to all landfills, that could possibly mean like a complete elimination of all plastics and landfills. Potentially mm -hmm. global. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other companies doing similar research to you guys? Um, a lot of the science that we're talking about is happening in research labs, but it's not of um, like production quality research yet. So it's not really, it's being researched, but it's not being It's done. not applied to this. Right. Yeah. To, right. right. Yeah. What we're proposing. And the reason, Sorry. Right. The reason we are targeting like hospitals in the healthcare industry is because unlike other like like places like here, you can just recycle plastic. They can't because of all the like contamination issues. Mm -hmm. Hazardous waste. And so they have to burn it. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up is Farm Flex Energy. So hello everybody, we are Farm Flex Energy, and to start off, we're gonna meet the team. So hi, I'm Gabriella Lockie. I'm Caroline Woods. I'm Kiana Okamura. I'm Abby Dandra. And we're just gonna jump right into it. So for our problem, there is a problem in increased drought and water scarcity in California that leads to the following issues shown above. 
Uh, there's a loss of livelihood and revenue, displacement of farmers, decreased optimization of land use, incre and increased water costs. And FarmFlex Energy is presenting the solution of a foldable, lightweight, and portable solar panel. This solution provides a multi-dimensional revenue stream designed to assist farmers while addressing sustainable issues mentioned before. All right, so our sustainable development goals. So we really focus in on three key goals, starting off with affordable and clean energy, and we're doing that via solar panels. So we are providing affordable and clean energy specifically to California. Um, and then we are doing that as well to, we're changing the industry, innovation, infrastructure of solar. So we're changing the applications of solar um, and doing that through innovative technologies. Um, and then our last one, sustainable cities and communities. So specifically, we're looking into that community sector um, and looking at small scale agriculture and rural California and those communities that are relying on agriculture. So our sustainability complex, um, we're focusing, like I said, on that household, the individual farmer um, and these are farmers who are facing um, adverse changes because of climate change. Um, so they're seeing lower production yield for various reasons, um, mostly due to climate change. And so we want to provide uh, another stream of revenue for them. Um, so that's how we're focusing on the household. And then community, um, so rural California, um, that is where agriculture is a huge part of that community. We are helping to support them. And then on the state level, um, we are helping California reach their renewable energy goals. So they have a goal to be 90% renewable energy in 2035. And so this would go to that. Great. Okay, so <laughs> the uh, California agriculture industry. So basically, uh, California kind of started as a monoculture system uh, because uh, most uh, most agricultural businesses are contract based, so they are um, contracted to create a certain type of crop um, and then they sell it to those people. Uh, in 2022, they were ranked the highest in agricultural sales. Uh, the farms made over 55.9 billion dollars, and then. Uh, they, were, they also became the leading producer of vegetables, fruits, nuts, and dairy. Um, but more recently, with the new uh, sustainable and like water-saving implications that were put into place, um, we have seen actually an increase in voicing the like rural communities and like the smaller local businesses, um, which is really big because. Um, the uh okay yeah so the next slide so there um farmers have diverse experiences across the world and in california which makes adapting to climate change complex they've always lived with and adapted to really uncertain weather conditions but recent extreme climate events have caused a new dilemma uh, studies have found a really large hesitance to believing in climate change due to the history and a resistance to, to accept the reality due to the uh, threatening of their access to their social networks and um, continuance into future generations. However, farmers are really realistic about needing and wanting to pursue a wide array of adaptations, especially ones that are easily available and publicly funded. Adaptations with multiple benefits um, motivate why, how, and when farmers change their ways of responding to climate events. Factors like saving time, money, and reducing their regulatory control entice farmers to adopt change. And many adaptations begin as temporary and reactive, but ensure that returning to prior farm structures and practices might be impossible or undesirable. Um, permanent changes include long-term solutions and moving off of agriculture to more stable off-farm income. Currently, the majority of US farm households are reliant on at least one off-farm uh, income. And in the future, there's a need for more common ground with farmers. Recent studies in farming communities found the need to separate climate belief and action in order to understand the viable impacts and solutions instead of focusing on causes and blame. And in order to reduce those risks, effective programs would accept new adaptations that provide multiple benefits for their actions. And the study that we were looking at specifically considered how normalcy and um, temporality is really important to farmers. 
as they're facing a need for actions that support them in regaining control over their own production and own building and also making their own decisions. So by us meeting farmers where they are, there's, we have a chance to address what matters most to them, build their adaptive capacity, and give them a chance to continue farming to the next generations. Yeah, and then adding on to that, like while there are a lot of people who do understand that their farming ways um, need to change, that doesn't mean that they can necessarily afford or want to do it. Um, so like a study showed that, you know, some people are actually increasing their agricultural productivity just to see how much they can get out of it before anything, any real um, laws are implemented. Um, so the great thing about our solar panels is that they're a way to transition into a sustainable level of farming without really losing any profit because they're still getting the revenue from the solar panels. And then, so a study was done that kind of um, interviewed like 23 of like the major stakeholders in California. Um, and it was found that 15 of them actually discussed solar as an option for repurposing agricultural land. Um, which was only behind 22 people that um, talked about habitat restoration um, and 12 that mentioned grazing. So this is huge because our goal by creating portable solar, solar panels is to combine all three of these possibilities. So by having solar panels that are portable, farmers can alter the location of the panels in like sort of a rotation, kind of like crop rotation, that will not only help with managing the water, but will also like help revive the soil. Um, and then um, with an elevated solar panel, uh, that also will leave room for grazing. So basically like while this isn't the um, intention, it's kind of like a side impact, like a positive impact of having portable solar panels, because um, it provides flexibility. So yes. Yeah, so the Williamson Act, which is the California Land Conservation Act, came about as population growth um, skyrocketed in California and suburban development was unregulated and turning agricultural land into um, developed land. And so in 1965, this policy was enacted and it currently protects the agricultural land with contracts that are about 10 to 20 years long and have to be, in order to get out of the contract, they have to go through a process to remove the pro the um, contract and right now there's about 16 million acres protected by the um, Conservation Act which is about half of the agricultural land and a third of privately owned land in California. So the problem with this is that farmers can't immediately repurpose their lands because they're legally obligated to keep their lands in agricultural production. So the reason why portable solar panels are a great solution to this is because they can be rotated out, meaning that the land can be used for solar for parts of the year when water is scarce and then removed during times of prime agricultural production. Um, and then because there's no permanent development um, being established onto the land and agricultural conduction, production is still ongoing, um, it's kind of like a loophole that could speed up the transition process for the conservation of water and keeping land in the work. And then another act that we saw that the solar panels could be a benefit for is the Endangered Species Act, which requires federal agencies to ensure that their actions don't jeopardize the existence of endangered species. Um, so it, a study was done that actually found that solar panels actually provided a sort of refuge for species such as like the kit fox, which is like the main endangered species of California. Um, and it, cause it increased their survivability rate from larger predators that were seen. So it's kind of like an extra um, source of revenue while also uh, protecting species such as these. So talk a little bit about climate change in California. We know that water, drought, and rising temperatures significantly impact the key crops. Um, in the last 30 years, or well before 2010, they lost about a million acres, and they're predicted, predicted to lose about another million in the next um, five years, so by 2030. And by 2050, the crop yields are predicted to decline about 40% for avocados, 20% for other um, crops and that land acreage will also be cut in half for some different crops and 22% for others. Um, however, agriculture can be a really big part of the solution. Currently, the California farmers are the leading producers of on-farm renewable energy 
and they're among the first in the country to embrace climate smart agriculture, which turns the farms into carbon sinks and reduces the GHG emissions. Uh, so there's a few state programs that have been um, advocated for in California for funding for farmers and ranchers to have more climate solutions. Um, there are a few that have um, been um, in place that are for different things that don't exactly appeal to the profitability or the actual reality of farmers. Um, the net, I think it's called net, net energy metering program allows customers to have solar panels and connect to the grid. However, there's a lot of restrictions and rules that pro prohibit them from actually gaining from this program. Um, in 2016, it found, they found the key problems with it are the farmers lack access and uh, um, information about what the program is. And the um, California Public Utilities Commission has a strict requirement that the meters have to be on contiguous land. However, farmers typically have their land sporadically around, which makes it really difficult to be able to have a solar system that goes with the um, policy, um, it goes against each other. So one government initiative that would really support our product is the 2018 Senate Bill 100. And it's a bill that basically says that California's electricity needs to be at least 60% renewable by 2030. And this is good because it's basically another incentive for the government to fund us. And if we can repurpose like the million plus acres of land that are being put out of agricultural production, it can amount to up to 8% of California's electricity. All right, so funding opportunities. So we found three that we felt really applied to our particular uh, innovative solution. So the first one being the Technology Advancement Program, which funds innovation and development of new renewable energy technologies in San Joaquin Valley, specific to California. Um, the second one is the Renewable Energy for Agricultural Program. Um, and this one also gives out grants for the installation of renewable energies specifically on agricultural operations, which is exactly what we're doing. Um, and the last one is Solar for All via the EPA. Um, the June 2023 enables low-income, disadvantaged households access to solar. Um, and so also a national funding opportunity. They requested over $38 billion go towards these renewable energy options. So where's the current research and application for this? So we focus in our research on monolithic and silica structures. So monolithic just means single crystal, and it's that, or you can have multiple crystal. Um, multiple crystals are going to be a cheaper option, but they're gonna be less efficient, and we wanted to prioritize that efficiency here. And we use silica, uh, which comes in this crystal form and is transformed into the solar panels that you see most of the time. Um, and with their rigid structures here, um, and we focused on two different kinds of silica structures. So we had an amorphous silica um, and then a crystalline silica, amorphous being in the non-crystal um, form. And so for amorphous silica, we did a series connection through apertures formed on film or a scaff cell. Um, and then we did thin crystalline. So instead of having the thick crystalline you'd normally see, you're using a thin crystalline that will allow it to be flexible and malleable. And so we picked these two for research um, because they're flexible, which is the priority here for our product. Um, they're pretty simple in manufacturing compared to other options, things that aren't silica, for example. Um, and then the research, especially for the scaff cells, are pretty high in reproducibility. So as you iterate through the research process, the efficiency remained pretty constant, um, which is good. We want that. Um, and then the laboratory efficiency was pretty comparable to the current standard cells. So. This is the flexible solar cells. You can see um, it's different in the way that it connects in the connection holes, and that allows it to be malleable, and that's kind of the malleability you want. It. All right, so for future research and infrastructure, um, what we need to do in order to actually make this viable, less materials going through assembly. So it'll increase the efficiency and lower the cost. Um, and then ensuring that from going from laboratory experiments to commercial solar production, there's usually a loss of efficiency. Right now it's relatively high, um, pretty variable, but we want it to be less than 2% loss. And then increasing the number of reactors in production would help with this, especially with the SCAF cells, um, and that would just help with efficiency and moving to that commercial scale. 
And then especially for those crystalline silica cells, as you make it thinner, so you're making it more malleable, but you're also having a higher light absorption loss. Um, you want to minimize this, finding that kind of perfect sweet spot between malleability um, and absorption loss, and also increasing the power conversion efficiency, so how much you can actually get from the sun. Um, so maximizing that. And then, of course, trying to keep it stable, like a normal solar panel, um, while still prioritizing flexibility. Um, and so there's a quote here about the scaff cells. It says, we believe that the process for scaff cells is an excellent adaptability to mass production, um, and the development of the production technologies is now in the final stage, which is really exciting um, and seems like a very viable option. The research is there. So for cost, we kind of have the blue chart, which is showing the installations of how solar is being how many uh, solar panels are being installed, and the green is kind of that cost. So with this trend continuing, we're really going to see the cost of solar panels drop and installations increase more. So we really have that going for us in our thing. Uh, here's our business model canvas, and we've kind of touched on a little bit of everything. The only thing that we didn't really like call out specifically is the surplus. We really want to invest our um, revenue back into the research to keep this going and continue it that way. And um, our last thing that we'll leave you guys with is a quote. So every 24 hours, enough sunlight touches the Earth to provide energy for the entire planet for 24 years. So really utilizing this solar energy power and kind of using it to the best of our advantage. And with that, uh, FarmFlex, that's it from FarmFlex Energy. Thank you. reaching out specifically to physically meet the farmers halfway? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So f the main thing with this business is you're going to have to make that physical and personable connection with the farmers because they don't like to be told what to do. So um, that's definitely in our business plan. And we want to be at those like farming events, be there at the tabling. Like We want to establish those connections because that's the only way that this is going to grow instead of trying to go through the government and force it down their throats and go that way. Like We want that personable connection, so definitely. Yeah. Um, so the material that you're using, I guess the silica or the crystals mm -hmm. or whatever it is that's like the root of the material, um, how, I guess you would need a lot of it if you're going to mass produce it. Is that a renewable resource? How is it, what happens if you run out of it? I guess, how does that work? Um, going through research, that's not really something we came across a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't answer your question for sure. But I would definitely say, like, it's in mass production. It's something that isn't really coming up as a huge problem. Um, and it's being, I think the big thing with using that, uh, right now at least, is that all of the rigid solar panels that we're using, the production right now, the production manufacturing, all the equipment is for that. And so for this, it makes it the most viable option instead of coming up with brand new manufacturing. Um, so kind of, I guess, we're like at the starting stage, like that is the best option, if that makes sense. But it's definitely something that I think is important to consider and should be considered. It's definitely a step in the right direction, right. but it's not considered renewable at this yeah. point. There's definitely like um, multi uses and they use different materials. There's like different solar panels that use both silicon and other options that are renewable. And so if you incorporated both, it's more but current, like the current research is at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, why do you believe other solar companies that work with farmers have not developed this idea for portable panels yet? I think um, a lot of it is just the farmers like not wanting to change their ways. Like most of them don't even want to consider going into solar, which is why we decided like portable because um, mm -hmm they don't have to completely give up their ways. Um, so I think it's really just like, uh, farmers that have been doing this for generations really don't want to consider any other option other than farming. So a lot of the solutions are focused on reducing emissions and reducing uh, like global and national emissions instead of working towards the productivity of farmers. So I think a lot of companies find the profitability more so in the global and national scale rather than community and individual. Uh, and that was 
question, Jake. But <laughs> my question is, like, what is the lifetime of these portable solar panels, like, compared to regular solar, solar panels? Mm. I, I think, oh, I was gonna say, don't know for sure, but I would assume since it's similar material, I would say they're probably pretty similar. Um, maybe slightly less, like even thinking about uh, the crystalline silica and the way that they're using it as a thinner level, so it might be slightly less durable, um, but still the same material, so maybe just slightly decreased. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well done. Thank you. And then last, but definitely not least, the Hydro Sink Initiative. <laughs> oh my god. I'm Sianna. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brandon. And today we are going to talk to you about the HydroSync Initiative. So, hold on. Oh. <laughs> All right. So to start, we're going to give you a little bit of background, and you're going to see how this kind of plays into HydroSync. So we're going to describe the smart grid system. So basically, this is a two-way interface system between the utility provider and the customer or the user. Um, and it gathers all the data. Um, it typically only runs with renewable energy sources, which we really like because we're trying to implement more renewable energy and sway away from the older traditional methods of fossil fuels. So smart grids definitely ensure that it takes into account renewable energy and it typically runs off wind and hydropower. For what we're doing, we're gonna be focusing more on hydropower, but it can definitely go into the realm of wind later on. Um, and basically, it's all about demand and supply. So it will sense um, through the sensors, it will take into account all the data coming in, and with that, it will either store or release the energy. So during times, um, specifically for hydropower, if there's less precipitation or water flow coming in, what it's going to do is it's going to have that stored energy and it's gonna release. If there's more, it will not release all of that at once. It will store it on for a later time. Oh. Okay. <laughs> all right, so smart grid advantages for the smart grid. Um, it's all about data analytics and optimization. So it's gathering all this data that it, that's coming in and it's basically optimizing the system for energy release. Um, grid resilience, the smart grid system is very resilient and reliable. It will actually repair itself um, so a lot of if a sensor goes down or a problem happens, a lot of times there's not the provider doesn't even have to step in. The system will start repairing itself. With that, that goes into remote monitoring. Um, you don't have to be physically at the system to collect the data or to repair the system. So it's less hands-on and that allows for basically less people on that end and quicker repairs so that you can get the system back up if anything happens. And then finally, optimized integration of renewable energy. Like I mentioned, it uses a lot of different renewable energy systems, so that is convenient so that we sway away from um, more traditional methods that are not great for our environment. <laughs> All right. So areas of improvement. The problems with the smart grid system right now, um, it's not really adapting to infrastructure. So it's basically not getting the, um, it's not understanding that certain, maybe like a large business is going to use more energy than a residential home. So a lot of times it will just kind of release all of the energy at once into these places and not evenly distribute it. And additionally, the system does not currently work in residential homes as well. 
um, and some older buildings because it's not adapted for that. So in the future, putting this into, you know, planning of infrastructure would be convenient um, or energy release. And that comes into demand response, which it's still not effective enough to where it will flow the energy at the correct time, basically. So sometimes there'll be excess energy and then in periods of drought, you know, there's not gonna be enough energy. So, and then finally data management, um, they still need advancements in capabilities um, and long-term effects. And that goes into um, our system. So our golden circle, um, we basically asked, um, our why is we wanted to increase energy security so that people start using the smart grid more um, because currently it's not being implemented everywhere because of these problems mentioned. How um, we want to add precipitation monitoring alongside infrastructure usage to the smart grid model so that it solves those areas of um, problems. And then what we're going to be doing is developing smart grid technology to adapt for hydropower, which leads us into HydroSync. So HydroSync is the utilization of sensors and weather data. So basically what would be added to the smart grid system is more precipitation monitoring through um, ga gauges. Um, and this would be not only for precipitation, um, but our first area of usage would also be any type of river flow um, or any water system in general. So where we want to base HydroSync off, and it will be addressed later, is in Seattle, Washington. Um, and the reason why we are going with Seattle is because 88% of their electricity from Seattle um, is generated um, by hydropower. So that's where we want to start. Um, and basically in times of heavy rainfall, it will be able to detect and store that energy for times of drought. And this is more long-term effects um, instead of short-term. So it's going to be the long-term effect over 10 years um, due to weather changes. Um, so the focus areas, um, really what we're doing is demand response. Like I said, we wanna make sure that every single infrastructure business, whether it's residential home or big corporation, that they receive the correct amount of energy at the right time. So this will be, um, this will be geared towards that, um, towards improving demand response, as well as infrastructural planning for the future. Um, these long-term climate assessments will um, be integrated for future development of infrastructure. Um, all right. Okay, so our sustainable development goals include affordable and clean energy. So by promoting renewable energy sources, improving energy efficiency, it aims to create a more sustainable and equitable energy future for all. Our sustainable cities and communities, so by promoting sustainable urban planning, um, it seeks to create cities that are livable, equitable, and environmentally sustainable for now and future generations. Um, climate action, so it recognizes that climate change is one of our greatest challenges of our time, and we need to like emphasize and take action to mitigate its impacts and build resilience to its effects. So it aims to safeguard the planet for current and future generations. And lastly, the life on land goal. Um, it emphasizes the importance of our biodiversity for sustainable development and the human well-being. So it's important to aim to ensure the long-term health and resilience of our planet's ecosystem. So for our business model, some of the key resources is utility companies, so invest in upgrading infrastructure, implementing new technologies, and integrating renewable energy sources to improve grid efficiency and sustainability. We need um, smart grid engineers to assist with technical design and the delivery of production systems, um, meteorologists to um, decode and analyze precipitation data, as well as data analysis to for infrastructure data and collection of applications. Some key activities, so what programs will our organiza organization be carrying out? The development of system changes to include precipitation analysis, the collection and analysis of data for current infrastructure usage, implementation of energy conservation from data, and climate adaptation recommendations from the data. And um, the essential groups we would need to deliver our program, and do we need special permission? So 
we would need um, Washington State Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, City, Government, and Power Authority, Environment Authorities, Transmission System Operators. So uh, we will need a government approval since we're changing their smart grid system. So, you know, by submitting an application, we would need a representative to advocate and submit a proposal and understand the specific state regulations as well as applying for funding. So for type of intervention, smart grid te technology for hydropower can be delivered as a service. So companies can provide hydropower forecasting services to utilities and grid operators. So this includes developing forecasting models based on weather data, water inflow forecast, and operational constraints to predict hydropower generations and optimize resource allocation and energy trading strategies. Um, for our channels, how are we reaching these customers and users? So collaborating with utility and energy providers to incorporate information about precipitation monitoring and smart grid technology into their customer communications and outreach efforts. So um, leverage existing channels such as newsletters, customer portals to reach to a broader audience. And who will we benefit from our service? So um, energy consumers benefit from a more reliable and resilient energy supply, smart grid technologies informed by precipitation monitoring and um, power outages, you know, improving service reliability and potentially lowering energy costs. Um, who will pay to address this issue? Utilities are responsible for distributing electricity to end users, so they rely on a mix of energy sources, including hydropower to meet demand. So utilities um, may pay for the hydropower forecasting services to better integrate variable renewable energy into their grid operation, optimizing um, dispatch strategies to ensure grid stability. And then our uh, value proposition, our beneficiary of our value prop is our hydropower energy security and our improved energy distribution something we've talked about this whole time. We also have emissions reductions, improved infrastructure, lower energy costs, and improved data analysis. These impact measures that we're gonna to use to show that we're improving those things are energy security analysis and reports, energy efficiency reports, cost benefit analysis, which we'll see in a second, and our environmental reporting. And then our customers are gonna get the ability to have more stable energy over time lower energy costs through this, cleaner air, cleaner water, and more efficient usage of resources. Our revenue is going to come mostly from grants that we get from the city, state, and federal level. This is through a combination of different utilities and the different um, agencies that we're working with. In total, we're going to need about $19.2 million of revenue for HydroSync which will have a $2 million benefit for the city of Seattle once they invest that money into our product. The 19.2 million comes from a cost structure with a 15% margin. Our cost structure is 9.2 million for our actual grid and research, and then 1.5 million for staffing. That includes our data analysis people and the ones that are actually implementing this technology. That leaves us a surplus of about 2.5 million which is going to be used for future projects and expansion into other energy types so that we can continue doing this work across the United States. Here's a cost benefit analysis for Seattle specifically. This is making the point that they should invest in this technology because it does save them money over time and makes cleaner air, lower emissions, et cetera. So, as I mentioned, our cost is 19.2 million. We want a 5% return at a 3.8 inflation rate for a cost benefit of 2 million, and then also doing a case study of 80% efficiency, 100% and 120%, with understanding that there is variability in our numbers with 2 million being our average, and then for a 15 year uh, time span with what we're using. Our base case shows that we're able to make about $8 million in 15 years with a 6% return and a payback period of 10 years. It's the financial show there. Our best case actually makes 13.6 million, almost 13.7, almost a 10% return, 
and an eight year payback period. So really great investment if we get that high of efficiency. In our worst case, actually we wouldn't be able to accept, although it still makes almost $3 million in 15 years with 11 year payback period, it doesn't give us a high enough return. So we would not be able to use that. But with the likelihood of using our base case at 15 years and make enough money back, this is a good investment for the city of Seattle and something that they should implement for financial reasons and for the emissions reductions that we've talked about this entire time and the increased stability of their grid. So our sustainability complex is um, community, city, and state. So within the community initiative and system development and analysis for smart grid and community change, um, in the city we would plan implementation of smart grids and infrastructure analysis. And within the state, the Department of Energy contracted to work with current systems. These are our citations. Citations and... Thank you. <laughs> our Arctic <laughs> Fox. <laughs> either already is or they're working on um, a system that automatically puts excess storage from um, sustainable like uh, energy resources, like automatically stores that energy and then uses it when they, there is a time of need. So I guess my question would be like, how would you persuade someone who would rather use just like the automatic storage when, they, when there is an excess versus yeah. So, um, yes, the smart grid system already does that, um, but it's not adapted enough to climate variability. So basically it's kind of taking it like year by year, um, time by time. But with climate variability, that's not always the best because they can't always predict things. That happens and the world is changing quickly. Um, there's a lot of precipitation in some places, drought in other places. We have effects such as El Nino, La Nina, which are like circulation effects. We have wind effects. We have a lot that takes into account precipitation as well as that all affects river flow. You know, Seattle, less precipitation. So a lot of times, a lot of this comes from river flow as well. Um, it's not taking effects. It, taking into effect the long-term effects of climate. So what this system does is over a 10-year period, um, it's taking effect all of the climate variability features and adapting it based off of that so it becomes even more efficient and reliable. So we're not creating a completely new system, we're changing their system of smart grids. And we're going to start that in Seattle. We're going to, over 15 years, see what happens with that system based off the um, what we save and based off our flow of income from that, then we're going to try to transfer that into other cities and possibly eventually the United States. But we're starting Seattle, we're starting like small in that sense, we're gonna see where it goes and then we're gonna adapt based off that, if that makes sense. And this actually does exist, just not in the United States. So it is the future of this technology and we figured that out after starting the, the research and we really want to bring that technology to give that advantage to the United States that so many other countries are working on right now. And our system is unique in the sense of, so there's actually HydroGrid, which is based off Vienna, which they, it's the European system, but it is different in the sense it doesn't take into account long-term long climate effects. We are taking into account long-term climate effects for efficiency. Okay. Yes. At the community level, what is the incentive for, let's say, me as an individual in a community to say, yeah, I want that here rather than, let's say, I already have some sort of hydropower resource. Why would I want to change? Yeah, so um, Brennan can probably talk a little bit more on that because that goes more into it's going to be cheaper for people. Yeah. So ultimately, um, and he can like address yep. that, but with those savings models as well, you're going to see how this is cheaper. So with this system working and saving energy and releasing at proper times and making sure that the energy is not over released in a sense of being wasteful over time that will bring down the costs for people um but that is something that we don't know exactly yet because it's again over this is 10-year data this is a 15-year model of that those savings so we don't have that exact amount but the incentive is that it will save 
money if you want to address more no, on I, how I think we save that was money. Perfect for the financial part. And then the other part of it that we talked about is the stability of energy. The base load will really be better through this system, which means that whenever our energy is spiking or going down, we're not going to have that big of an impact and we're not going to rely on the natural gas and the oil that we would be pulling in during those uh, times that we're not able to have a good base load. Yeah. So this makes cleaner air in your city. So mm -hmm. you're saving money and gain a cleaner city at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, from Jay, yeah. uh, where is smart grid technology being most effectively utilized today? So we talked about Vienna earlier. That's one of the really big ones. So they implemented a system like this, able to then do the analysis of this is exactly what energy we have to put out, and this is the type of energy we're putting out so that they have a lot cleaner system that we're hoping to bring to the United States. Seattle currently has a smart grid system, yeah. and that's how they are using it. Like I said, 88% is hydropower currently to for electricity in Seattle. They're using a smart grid system. We're not, we're not basically replacing their system. We're changing their system. So that's why we mentioned a lot about the government, because we need government approval for that. Um, and that would be under their just jurisdiction, um, because we are keeping the smart grid system. We are just making it more efficient. Um, and obviously 15 years is a long time yeah. to like see how something is going. So I'm assuming you're going to expand in that time. Yeah. And what criteria would you uh, consider when expanding to other locations? Like how would you choose your next That's location? Good question. Um, I think definitely thinking about what cities are using hydropower because that's the system that we're developing right now. Mm -hmm. From there, we're able to start expanding into other energy sources and expanding the scope of work that we're doing. But hydropower is the start, and it's mm -hmm. really the one that has a really big impact, as we saw here in Iceland and back home in Seattle. So other cities that have the infrastructure for hydropower that we can improve and be able to invest more money into and then expanding from there. Mm -hmm. Over time, um, possibly creating even for like wind, because certain areas might not um, focus on hydropower. Um, right now we're focusing on hydro hydropower, but our main focus is long-term effects and long-term climate variability. So adapting the system to also later include wind um, with increased funding um, and success, um, we're able to uh, go throughout the whole scope of renewable energy resources. Um, congratulations to all of you guys for completing your capstone projects. I'm very proud of all the work you've done. Um, clap for everyone. Uh, and I just want to say thank you so much for taking some ideas that you had from scratch and then developing them into uh, like actionable plans for sustainable development in the future. Um, as someone in entrepreneurship, I really encourage you guys to take what you learned here, the tools that we've presented to you guys, and come up with solutions, either going forward with the business ideas that you presented here today, or other ideas that you have, and just seeing what's out there, because you guys are the future of sustainability, and uh, with the right team around you guys, and uh, the pe people that are also interested and passionate about sustainability, you guys can make big change. Uh, so thank you so much. Ha, ha, ha.